But this video is made possible by Masterworks. More on this in a bit. Belarus is the perfect example of a country that never left behind the power structure of the former communist empire. So, in keeping with Hollywood movies, whenever they talk about former Soviet republics, it is a relatively poor country, ruled with an iron fist by a bizarre tyrant. And it's not only us labeling him a tyrant. Let me remind you that this is something that he boasts about himself. An authoritarian style of rule is characteristic of me, and I have always admitted it. It's better to be a dictator than gay. Alexander Lukashenko, President of Belarus. We're talking about a dictator who, faced with the inflation crisis the world is experiencing, has come up with a perfect solution to prohibit inflation by law. Yep, yep, that's what I said. Inflation banned in Belarus. Belarus bans consumer price rises in bid to tame inflation. Let's see. In this video, we are not going to get into why trying to ban inflation is, from an economic point of view, a gigantic mistake. You can find that discussion on Visual Economic, our new economics channel. If you haven't heard about it yet, then go ahead and check it out. Of course, banning inflation is not the only measure taken by this tyrant in an effort to contain prices. Have you heard about the general mobilization for the potato harvest? Well, take a look. Belarus. Mobilize children to harvest potatoes and apples, says Lukashenko. He started with the children and ended up putting half of the country in the same basket. Be that as it may, this is not the reason why Belarus is starring in this video. The truth is that beyond his peculiar economic policy, Lukashenko has been attracting international attention recently. And it is doing so, no less, because it is the country that most supports the horrific Russian invasion of Ukraine. There is even speculation that Belarus may eventually join the offensive against its southern neighbor. For example, in June, the government of what is known as Europe's last dictator announced the creation of the Southern Operational Command, a combat force to be deployed on the border with Ukraine. It also announced the expansion of the army, and more recently, in early October, confirmed that a joint military contingent will be created with Russia. In theory, this will entail the arrival in the country of thousands of soldiers from the land of the former Tsars. According to the Lukashenko regime, this decision was taken to protect its borders. We emphasize once again that the tasks of the regional force group are purely defensive, and all activities carried out at the moment are aimed at providing a sufficient response to actions near our borders. Viktor Krenin, Belarus Defense Minister. Of course, no one bought it. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky himself set off the alarm bells during the next G7 session and proposed sending UN teams to the Ukrainian-Belarusian border to prevent a new escalation of the conflict. On the border of Ukraine and Belarus, we can place a mission of international observers to monitor the security situation. The format can be worked out by our diplomats. I ask you, on the level of the G7, to support this initiative. Vladimir Zelensky, President of Ukraine. This, of course, will not happen, because as we all know, when it comes down to it, and beyond the politics of gestures and declarations, the UN is not good for much. The fact is that since no one trusts Lukashenko, and as military movements in Russia and Belarus keep happening, as the Russians seem to be losing the war, of course, one question has arisen everywhere. To what extent is Belarus thinking of joining the Russian offensive against Ukraine? What exactly are they going to use this kind of joint army they have announced for? What could this mean for the Ukrainian army? In this video, we're going to answer all these questions for you, but first, we have another question to answer. Why on earth does Lukashenko still support Putin? But before we go on, let me tell you a little about Masterworks. Did you know that contemporary art prices outpaced the S&P 500 by 131% from 1995 to 2021? And we're not talking about a small market. It is estimated that the total value of privately held art is around $1.7 trillion. Day by day, art is becoming more and more consolidated as a diversification option for large portfolios. In fact, according to Deloitte, 85% of asset managers recommend art as an asset to be included in portfolios. But okay, I'm sure many of you are thinking, what does this have to do with me. How am I going to diversify my portfolio with a painting worth millions of dollars? Masterworks is the first platform for buying and selling shares representing an investment in iconic artworks. With Masterworks, you can co-own exclusive pieces of art that can help diversify your wealth and protect it from inflation. And who knows, they may even help you earn a nice return. For example, investors who bought Banksy's Mona Lisa with Masterworks achieved an annualized return of 32%. We'll leave a link where you can find all the information about Masterworks in the description. What's more, you can skip the waiting list to register by using that link below. And as always, in everything related to investment, use your head, nothing is risk-free. 
from disobedience to submission. Alexander Lukashenko has been ruling Belarus since 1994. During this time, his regime has been transformed from a more or less soft authoritarian government into an increasingly corrupt and repressive autocracy. A dictatorship that keeps more than 1,300 political prisoners in jail and has turned the country into a wasteland of political alternatives, despite the regime being terribly unpopular. Not surprisingly, along the way, freedom of the press has completely disappeared. And with a GDP of just over $7,000 per capita, one of the lowest in Europe, it is estimated that barely 25% of the population supports or sympathizes with this government. We are talking mainly about pensioners, bureaucrats, and members of security teams. Of course, what the government does not achieve with popular support, it achieves with the force of guns, truncheons, and handcuffs. In a way, this is very similar to the political situation in Mother Russia. And speaking of Russia, although Putin and Lukashenko now seem almost like blood brothers and unbreakable allies, the truth is that they have not always gotten along so well. In 1999, the Belarusian dictator signed an agreement with Russian President Boris Yeltsin to create a full political and economic union between the two countries. The idea was to create a supranational entity that would eventually end up being responsible for economic policy, foreign policy, and defense. There was even speculation that the countries would eventually end up having the same currency, common courts, and even a single parliament. What is most surprising of all is that everything indicates that, at that time, the Belarusian leader thought that he would himself manage this mega nation. In other words, the move Lukashenko had in mind was something like a kind of takeover bid, where the little fish would swallow the big one. His idea was that Belarus would end up controlling all of Russia. However, with Putin's accession to power, those plans went down the drain, and the Belarusian takeover bid was turned upside down. Suddenly, the deal became something of a gateway to Russia's annexation of this country. For that reason, Lukashenko stopped the whole process in its tracks. And not only that, after the Russian annexation of Crimea, Belarus, which seems to be aligned with Moscow, began to smell a rat. So what do you think the last dictator of Europe did then? Well, basically, he wanted to play games with Moscow by forging closer ties with the West. In fact, he didn't even recognize Crimea as part of Russia and relations became more and more strained until 2020. That year, in 2020, there was an election, a rigged election, which Lukashenko won with 80% of the vote. You know, a clear and resounding victory. But this time, things were not going to stay that way. Popular indignation resulted in huge revolts that almost overthrew the dictator. So the question is, what do you think happened? Well, Putin became something of a lifeline for the Belarusian tyrant. He sent propagandists, security teams, money, and finally even confirmed that he would intervene militarily. In other words, he would send tanks to support his new friend. Because of course, all this support was not in exchange for nothing. From that moment on, Lukashenko would become a puppet of Moscow, and plans for the progressive integration of the two countries would be put back on the table. But why on earth is the Kremlin so interested in this country? Well, you see, Russia has been trying to grow its political, economic, and military ties with Belarus since the 1990s. However, this effort has gained traction since 2020. And there are three main reasons that we can find behind all this interest, and which explain why this is an absolutely strategic issue for the Kremlin. Firstly, Belarus was important for the Russian economy because more than 20% of all Russian gas exports to Europe passed through Belarus. Secondly, this country is the shortest way to reach the Kaliningrad Oblast, and would allow the cutting off of the Suwalki Corridor, a narrow strip of land on the Polish-Lithuanian border that could prevent the passage of NATO forces into the Baltic countries. And thirdly, due to Putin's own obsession with restoring Russia's greatness. Essentially the same motive that has pushed him into the Ukrainian war. And what better for Putin than to both expand Mother Russia and re-establish the greatness of this new empire? You can see once again that there are no coincidences. To make matters worse, the international sanctions caused Belarus's dependence on Russia to multiply. And as you can imagine, Putin had no problem in giving a lot of loans to support his new lackey. And so, visual politic viewers, that explains why, after the ruthless Russian invasion of Ukraine, we have come across statements like these. Those who reproach us, don't you know that we have the closest alliance with the Russian Federation? With them, we are a single powerful independent state, the Union State. We have been and will be together with fraternal Russia. Our participation in these special operations was decided by me a long time ago, Alexander Lukashenko, President of Belarus. However, despite this, the dictator has executed a meticulous balancing plan throughout the war. On the one hand, he did allow that. Before the invasion, 30,000 Russian troops were deployed in his country. These were the troops that on 24th of February 
were launched on Kyiv. He also allowed Russia to use his country to carry out a massive missile launch against Ukraine. Even four days after the invasion, Lukashenko revoked his country's constitutional neutrality, now allowing Russia to station permanent troops and even nuclear weapons. Remember the nickname Putin's puppet? Well, now you can see why. What Belarus did not do, however, was to join the war directly. And now the question is, why have rumors been flying that this may soon change? Does the creation of the joint military contingent mean that Belarus is about to change that position and join the fray? If so, what exactly would Ukraine be facing? Well, let's take a look. War Drums During the Cold War, this territory was very important for the Soviet Union. The troops stationed in the so-called Belo-Russian Soviet Socialist Republic had the mission to be the spearhead of the Red Army in the event of the outbreak of conflict with the West. That is why a large part of the Warsaw Pact's most modern military equipment, including a quarter of all Soviet intercontinental ballistic missiles, could be found right there. However, after the fall of the USSR, the situation changed completely. Today, the Belarusian army is ridiculously small and terribly outdated. Almost all of its equipment is decades old, and comes from the former Red Army. In fact, this is one of the few countries that spends more on internal security than on its armed forces. In other words, we are not talking about a military dictatorship, but above all, a police state. That is exactly where the regime has concentrated almost all of its resources. Meanwhile, the military budget accounts for barely 1% of GDP, about $700 million annually, despite having increased in recent years. And that's not all. Almost all of it goes to current spending. Investment in the purchase of weapons and military equipment is minuscule. To give you an idea, between 20 2014 and 2019, the country barely allocated $898 million to this issue, an annual average of $180 million minus payments to corrupt officials. And of course, this lack of funding explains why the Belarusian army consists of only about 50,000 soldiers. And that's not all. Of these troops, it is estimated that only 17,000 are currently trained and ready for deployment. And that is being generous. Many sources reduce this estimate even further to a range of between 6,000 and 10,000 troops. To make matters worse, since the outbreak of the war, Belarus has delivered a lot of equipment to Russia. We don't have the troops or the military hardware. A lot of hardware has already been handed over to the Russian Federation. There are few combat-ready troops troops up to 7,000 and they are not ready for an assault operation. Franak Vyachorka, senior advisor to the Belarusian opposition leader Svetlana Tiskanuskaya. But take note that the lack of troops is not the only striking fact. For example, it is estimated that the Air Force has only 24 combat capable aircraft and that the army could only count on some 200 old Soviet T-72 tanks. What they do have, as a deterrent measure, is a reserve of supposedly more than 290,000 people. But the truth is that nobody seems to care that they have the minimum equipment and training to be of any use in this war. Then they have quite a lot of equipment in storage, but it remains to be seen in what state it is in. After seeing the Russian disaster in Ukraine, it does not seem that much can be expected from Belarus. But wait a minute, if that's the case, then why on earth is there so much talk about Belarus? Why all the rumors and this kind of military game that Moscow and Minsk have been playing lately? Well, here we can also find three possible answers. First of all, the Russian and Belarusian soldiers being deployed once again on the border with Ukraine could have the objective of forcing Kyiv to move part of its troops to this area to prevent a possible fresh attack. This could somewhat reduce the enormous pressure that the Russians are suffering in the east and south of Ukraine. These are areas where, as you know, Ukrainian troops are making significant advances. Some even suggest that if things continue to deteriorate, Moscow could attempt a new assault on Kyiv, if only to force a negotiation or wear down the Ukrainian forces. Secondly, Belarusian troops could be used to defend the rear or supply networks so that Russia can send more units to the front while continuing to use Belarusian soil for missile attacks. And thirdly, the exact opposite may be happening, that all these announcements simply end up translating into the donation of the equipment that Belarus has. In fact, we're seeing a lot of transfers of equipment, such as tanks and tons of ammunition from Belarusian warehouses to the front, which seems incompatible with seeking a military mobilization in the country. The military leaders are trying to calm down the troops, saying they will not be embroiled in the war, as the troops are very worried seeing the success of the Ukrainians. No one wants to fight for Putin. Franak Vyachorka, senior advisor to the Belarusian lead opposition leader Svetlana Tiskanuskaya. In fact, Belarus's entry into the war could be counterproductive. Why? Well, because on the one hand, it could end up making Washington give Ukraine long-range rocket launchers, and on the other hand, it could put Lukashenko on the ropes. 
keep in mind that the war is tremendously unpopular in Belarus. According to polls, less than 10% of the population supports participation in the war. In fact, sabotage operations against the Russian army have been frequent, and even high-ranking officials, such as the Deputy Defense Minister, have resigned in protest against the support for Russia. Of course, Putin has a lot of leverage, but he cannot compel Lukashenko to commit political suicide. Artrom Schreibman, a Belarusian political analyst. As you can see, Belarus has little to contribute beyond outdated equipment. Who knows what state it is in? Of course, if this war is characterized by anything, it is Moscow's lack of rationality. And who knows, that could become contagious to its cronies. Be that as it may, what is clear is that the Lukashenko regime has been complicit in an inhuman and cruel wave of violence and terror. And that is why his regime must be the target of all international sanctions. But having said that, it's your turn. Do you think we will eventually see Belarus declaring war on Ukraine? Is this the penultimate bullet Moscow is keeping to try to reverse the defeat it is suffering? How do you think this conflict will develop? Leave us your comments below. And now, if you found this video interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe to Visual Politic if you haven't already done so. Also check out Visual Economic, 100% recommended. Thank you very much for watching. All the best. See you next time.